Hey everybody, welcome to the Rhinestone Podcast. My name is Banner Driscoll. I'm the CEO and founder of Rhinestone Productions. At Rhinestone Productions, we have one goal, and that is to empower all musical creatives to make their most authentic music. Now, when I started this podcast, I thought I was mostly gonna be interviewing friends, family, people I have worked with in the industry, and this was probably one of the biggest surprises, especially being this is our only our third episode. And what happens was, I found the Instagram profile of our next guest. I liked a couple of his posts. He turned around and liked a couple of my posts. I had no idea in a million years he would fancy anything I was doing. I feel like such a small person compared to this, this incredible artist. And before you knew it, we were chatting. I noticed he was liking a lot of the posts about Rhinestone Productions. And I went ahead and I said, hey man, uh, you know, I, I would love to have you on the podcast. Somehow he said yes. And that person is the one and only Gordon Raphael. If you don't know Gordon Raphael, I guarantee you heard his music. Most famously, he's produced the first two Strokes records, Is This It and Room on Fire. I think by most Strokes fans, those are considered the best records of their career. Features such hits as Reptilia, uh, Is This It, uh, Last Night. Uh, what else is on those records? There's so many good ones. Uh, Someday. Gosh, there's so many just good songs. Along with The Strokes, he also produced the incredible, underrated, amazing album, uh, Soviet Kitsch by Regina Spector. I think this is one of the records that I think people have just forgotten about, and it is just so good, especially the song Us. I think immediately as soon as I heard this record, I was, it's gonna be one I'm definitely gonna pick up on vinyl soon. It's just incredible. Gordon really, on that album, I think he shines even more than he does on The Strokes. So anyway, we had this interview with Gordon, and Gordon was just such a delight. He talked to us about anything and everything. We asked him about how to build a proper music studio, what to look for in a producer. We got all sorts of great stories about the strokes, about the precision that those guys would have. Those guys were not the kind of people to let mistakes go easily, and they cared so much about how the sonics sounded in their work. And I think it's fascinating because I think they are one of the, the great rock bands of all time now I mean they've just proven it album after album and so to hear these stories firsthand from someone who was there and was directly involved is just an incredible experience um, we got to talk about all sorts of stuff he gave us some recommendations for music some gear that he loves we talked about the differences between recording sterile clean signal and recording something a little bit dirty a little bit more colored um, something that gives recordings life and interesting uh, interest so this episode to me, I think is one of the, the coolest things I've ever gotten to do in my life. Uh, you know, a lot of people say, don't meet your heroes. This was definitely a case where I got to meet my hero and he was phenomenal. He was awesome with his time. Um, and I just can't wait for you guys to hear this conversation. So without further ado, here's our interview with Gordon Raphael. Hi everybody, welcome to the Rhinestone Podcast. My name is Banner Driscoll. I'm founder and CEO of Rhinestone Productions. At Rhinestone Productions, we have one goal, and that is to empower all musical creatives to make their best music and to represent their most authentic selves through their music. And I don't think there's anybody who's inspired me quite as much as this next guest. Today we have Gordon Raphael on the podcast. Gordon Raphael is a music producer, engineer, and musician. As a producer, Gordon is most famous for working on the first two records from The Strokes, Is This It? and Room on Fire, as well as Regina Spector's critically acclaimed album, Soviet Kitsch. As a musician, Gordon has lent his keyboard skills to both the psychedelic furs and legendary Seattle band Sky Cries Mary, along with leading his own bands, Black Light and Absinthe. In 2022, Gord made his literary debut with his memoir, The World is Going to Love This, Up from the Basement with the Strokes. I've got a copy of it right here. Fantastic book, by the way. Loved it. Such a good book. An exciting and thrilling ride describing Gordon's journey through the Seattle grunge scene of the 90s, his experience meeting and producing the Strokes, and several other great rock and roll stories. Today, Gordon maintains an active producing and engineering schedule that takes him all over the world, working with all types of artists. Gordon, welcome to the Rhinestone Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me aboard. Awesome. So, Gordon, I think I'm going to start a little bit off the beaten path here, but I think this is going to be a really good segue into a lot of different subjects that I think our audience is going to be really interested in. And so I want to start by asking you about somebody in particular. Who is Anna Mercedes and why is she important to your story? Oh, wow. Let's see. 
I met Anna Mercedes when I think she was just turning 18, and I was in a very popular Seattle band, Sky Cries Mary. Now, during Sky Cries Mary, I had my first big success where I had like publishing deals and record deals and touring and all the things I dreamt about my whole life were finally coming true in Sky Cries Mary. And I was spending my days in a basement with lots of recording equipment and synthesizers, like everything I'd ever dreamt of, all my favorite synths and guitars, making cool soundtracks. And I wanted to have a vocalist who could match my sounds with energy. And I met Anna Mercedes and she started singing on my songs and we formed a band called Absinthee. Now, Absinthee was incredible. I actually stopped working with Sky Cries Mary just to pursue full-time Absinthee. It was really my heart's desire, this music. And right at the time we were doing that, the grunge scene in Seattle was falling apart. Like Kurt Cobain had offed himself. Soundgarden had broken up. Alice in Chains was having a bad time with their singer Lane. Like it just seemed like things were going down. And so we moved to New York City and her family helped me build Transporteram Studios, which is where I recorded The Strokes. So meeting this great singer, moving to New York and building this studio kind of set me up for everything that I'm doing these days. It was a real miracle. And I think it's it's interesting to know, Anna Mercedes has some pretty interesting parents who you mentioned in the book who help you out a lot. Do you want to tell everybody who her parents are? Her parents run this incredible recording studio in Woodenville, which is a suburb of Seattle. It's called Bear Creek Studio. And bands like, I don't know, Soundgarden, Foo Fighters, Afghan Wigs, Eric Clapton, Lionel Richie, you name it. Many, many bands uh, record there. Brandy Carlisle. Uh, Lumineers. Uh, it's an incredible, legendary studio out on a farm. I even recorded The Strokes and Regina Spector there one time. So it's just, it's a, my preferred place to work, really. Um, and so her parents run that studio, and they were very kind and generous, not only letting us record there in Absinthee, but they actually flew out to New York to help me build and decorate Transporteram Studio, which became legendary. And I, well, the reason I bring up Bear Creek is I'm actually originally from Seattle, and I I love um, Bear Creek is one of those legendary places. I've never got to record there, never been there, but it is one of the most fascinating studios because it's it's in a little, um, like it's in the woods in in Seattle outside of. I mean, it's just out of the middle of nowhere, and it's just world renowned. It's brought in all these amazing artists and stuff like that. So the reason I want to talk about Bear Creek with you for a minute is you got to spend a lot of time there as a musician before your big production days. Is that correct? Absolutely. I got to I got to hear my own music sung when Anna Mercedes would sing. Her dad would whip out these vintage, you know, AKG microphones that were so good that I literally slapped my knees and laughed because I never heard a voice sound like that. I certainly didn't have those kind of microphones in my studio. So what is it about Bear Creek that makes it so magical for so many artists that draws people in? What do you think about it that like has that effect? I know the answer. There's, there's a list of answers. And if you're going to go from my heart, it would be the first thing is the actual environment of the rooms. There's a small wooden room that feels like you're in, in an antique barn. And then there's a giant open space that feels like you're in an artist's playland or wonderland for sound. So the environment mixed with the Trident console, the vintage microphones, the Hammond organ, synthesizers, guitar, all the equipment they have there is just perfect. So you can just get lost making the greatest sounds in the greatest rooms. That's the first thing, okay? Mm -hmm. The next thing would be look out the window. It's surrounded by 100-foot-tall pine trees, like yeah. cedars, yeah. firs, elms, you name it. And, and I go into detail in my book about the feeling of looking out the window on cloudy days and seeing these trees. It's a major part of the vibe. And then the owners, Manny and Joe, the way they have built it and the way they have put their care and attention into it, you can just feel the energy. It just feels like a magical, protected space for artists to do their best work with no distractions. 
That's it. That's awesome. And so when you were building all your studios, you know, you have mm -hmm. all sorts of different ones that you mentioned in the book that you built from the ground up. What did you learn from Bear Creek that you were able to apply into your own studios? Bring, bring Joe Hadlock, the owner of Bear <laughs> Creek, out with his table saw, get Manny to decorate it with purple velvet and build couches and curtains and backdrops. And that's, the, that's, that's what I learned. And they did it for me in New York and they did it for me in London. And then they, Manny even came out on the Second Strokes album and decorated another studio that was a professional studio already in New York to look like our old studio. You know, we really get the vibe. Was there any differences in like atmosphere as far as like, um, so obviously like Bear Creek's nature oriented, it's out in the woods in Seattle and you were making stuff in New York City, which is very dense. Was there any like aesthetic differences between those two? Completely aesthetic differences left and right. You know, you look out the window at Bear Creek and you see trees and a creek and dogs running around and pastures and horse fields and things like that. In my studio, you open the door and there's like hundreds of restaurants and bars in the coolest no location in the East Village. And you're in a basement, in a bunker, like underground in a real gritty area. So, but inside my studio, it was just beautiful, like purple velvet, as I said, and dim lights and antique weird dolls and blown up amplifiers and old drum sets, microscopes, bookshelves. It had a great feeling inside that was not like the streets of New York City. It was like another magic land in this basement. That's so cool. What were the, just the microscopes? Was that just like decoration? You guys weren't doing any biology in there or anything, were you? <laughs> My grandpa gave me his microscope, a really great one. And I thought it would look great on a bookshelf in my recording studio. And the bookshelf not only looked nerdy and cool, but it actually diffused the sound coming off the speaker. So it had an <laughs> acoustic function. What? And that's Joe Hadlock from Bear Creek. He designed that, you know, just put a bookshelf back there. You don't, you don't want a concrete wall bouncing that sound. If you put a bunch of books and, and things in that shelf, you're going to have great acoustic absorption. And so this gorgeous bookshelf with my microscope on it and other things uh, really had a function. That's so cool. That is really cool. So when, what do you think is the biggest mistake people make when they're building their own studio? A lot of our audience is independent musicians. They're recording at home. What would you, you've built several studios. You mentioned at least three in the book. And, you know, obviously you saw, you know, uh, Manny Hadlock work and all these other people. What would you say is the biggest mistake people make when building their own studio or their home studio? I don't know. I don't know a lot of people that made mistakes building studio. I don't even know a lot of people that built their own studio. I just say that the guideline would be build a special place that's like a temple for the function that you want it. Like some people just want to invite expensive clients over and impress them with million dollars worth of gear and certain modern lighting. Like that's cool if that's what you want to do. You know, I want to you know, you can see my background here. This is my music room. This is where I listen to music and I mix and I do everything. And it doesn't look like a commercial studio. You know, it's just got a mm -hmm. colors, uh, texture, like the room should be not only good sounding, but it should make you feel like you want to be there for a long hour. You always love being there. Just when you walk in, you just feel inspired. That's it. Yeah. And I think that's super important. If you don't enjoy being in the space you're creating in, you're not going to create if that's your special space. I mean, I've seen so many people build such sterile backgrounds and I think it's so important to have that vibe. And I think that's what I think you, you, you describe a lot in the book about how important the vibe is and how that sold people uh, on to hire you and use your studios. Yeah. It's not only in the environment. I mean, like, Recording equipment can be very sterile, you know, they make really clean modern equipment. They make very clean converters. They make converters with clean preamps in them. They make microphones that sound clean. And it's also just like a sterile studio using, you have to be very careful to get colored sound and you have, and tones and variations and paint shades that come from really great microphones like German Neumann microphones and good preamps like Neves and SSL and good speakers, every, all that stuff you want to 
build colors. You don't want everything to be so clean and pristine. That's for me anyway. And so what what makes a good studio environment for you now? Like what it, what are the key elements when like a band comes in that that obviously the gear, obviously the the vibe of the room, but is there anything else that creates a good studio environment in your opinion? It's it's only three things. Like I work in studios all over the world. I work in my nearby city is Leeds. I work in a little studio there. There's like three things I want. The first thing when I walk into the room, I want it to be like, oh, this is cool. Look at that orange wall. Oh, look at that cool, you know, synthesizer display. I want it to look cool like I'm in a, a place I want to be. A. Has to have that. Secondly, it has to have like some of the most amazing music equipment in the world. It has to have some API, some Neve, some Avalon, some Neumann. You know, it's got to have... Doesn't have to have millions of dollars worth of that stuff. Doesn't have to have ten of each. But give me like six really good channels and five really good microphones, and the rest could be Mackie. Sorry, Mackie. The rest could be the rest could be Sure SM57s. I'll be happy as clam if I have five good mics and five solid channels. I can make records that sound world class. So. That's it, you know, just walk in the environment. And then the third thing, it has to work. You know, it can't be like, oh, there's a little loose connection or that cable isn't working or, oh, that preamp, it's, it's dodgy, you know, it worked yesterday. I don't, anything like that is a real vibe killer. So really it's three simple things. And luckily 98% of all studio sessions I do for the past 15 years have been that way. Do you have a opinion as far as the rise of like uh, digital effects and digital preamps and stuff like that, as opposed to the analog stuff? Like obviously you've been doing it long enough that you, you've seen the analog stuff and you've seen the digital stuff come in. Do you use any of that stuff now? Or are you, I, uh, do. Do you... I do. And has sent me a recording and I could tell that, boy, they're just using, you know, this clean microphone and this real clean, whatever. It just the, I hear the singer's good, but the sound of the recording is a bit boring, a bit dull, a bit just normal. Well, I'll use a UAD Neve 1073 plugin or an Avalon plugin, you know, if I want to add some character. Now, when I record myself and I record through a Neve, well, if you're asking me if I'd rather use uh, a plug-in Neve or a real one, I'll say I'll, a real one, a new one, an old one, a medium one. You know, I don't care what year it is, but it's going to give me that sound instantly, and I won't have to fuss around with plugins later. It'll already be recorded perfect, right? So, uh, on the other hand, even when I record stuff really well, sometimes I want to use the Universal Audio. API graphic EQ, the 560, you know, like that thing's magic. Like I love the sound of that EQ. So in that case, you know, it's a very helpful thing all the time. So is it more when you're mixing, you're using those digital plugins or is it, if you're recording, do you prefer to use the analog stuff right off the bat? Yeah. If I'm recording, I want to use class, class A, you know, recording gear, SSL, API, Neve and Avalon. You know, that's what I want to record through every time if I can. Okay, but if somebody sends me something and they don't have that equipment, they have some just like kind of, they're using like the converters in an Apogee or the converters in a Symphony or all that, you know, that kind of built into your converter stuff is pretty damn sterile. So I will, I will reach for a plug-in to try, I'll, I'll use tape, I'll use Kramer tape. You know, I'll use anything I can to make that, clean boring sound sound like it's recorded well to begin with that's awesome hey everybody i wanted to take a break from our conversation with gordon Raphael and tell you a little bit more about rhinestone productions particularly our virtual studio model now a lot of people what they want to do when they record music is they try to get a bunch of musicians together and they try to go into the studio they pay for an engineer they pay and they try to record as quickly as possible. It's a very stressful scenario. And honestly, a lot of times the production and the quality just falls flat. 
Now there's a lot of reasons for this, but I think the big one is that the process of going into a studio and recording is so rushed, it's so stressful. You have to have everything tight before you even go into the studio that so many musicians mess up. They don't get the takes they want, they don't plan, they don't know how to go and make a better recording. And so the virtual studio model that we have at Rhinestone Productions, I think solves that issue. So instead of going out and trying to find all these musicians to bring in to work on your stuff, we have a set team of A-plus musicians from around the world. These guys are people that play on hit records, they play in jazz ensembles, they play in orchestras. These are musicians of an A-plus caliber who are versatile and know what to do to take your music to the next level. So instead of going in and trying to record everything all at once, the virtual studio model basically goes and says, all right, let's start and let's get a good drum take going. Then we're going to add the bass. Then we're going to add the keyboards and the guitars. And then we can add horn sections. We can add strings. We can add backing vocals. And then we're going to make sure that we produce you in a way that sets you up for the success that you want, which we'll talk about. The other thing that's very different is you're going to get a producer. Now, a lot of people think that when they hire a engineer, they're getting an engineer and a producer, but a lot of times engineers don't know what works musically. A lot of times engineers how to know how to get things to sound good, but that doesn't mean they're going to translate into the kind of success that people want when they go and record in a recording studio. So what Rhinestone does, before we even start working on a song, what we do is we sit down with the artist and we make sure that you are getting into the place that you want to go. In the same way that if you want to be a pop star, you have to record pop music. We figure out where you want to go and we reverse engineer a sound that works to get you in a position for success. And that honestly is the rhinestone difference. So not only are you going to get top quality musicians when you work with us, but you're also going to get a producer who works with you to make sure that you are getting to the place that you want to go. Whether that's Spotify playlist, whether that's pop radio, whether that's country radio, whether that's alternative radio. Whatever you do, we're going to try in our very best to give you the best chance for success. And we've seen that success. We've helped artists get on the radio. We've helped artists land playlists. We've helped artists get label attention. So if that's what you want to do, work with a team that knows how to do it, who knows how to get you going, and knows how to put you in the place for success. At Rhinestone Productions, we have one goal, and that is we want to see you shine. And by listening to this episode, if you email us at rhinestonemusic at gmail.com, the keyword Gordon, we will give you $25 off your first instrument that you get from us. So a lot of times our drums cost $100 per song. How about getting drums for $75 a song? High quality drums with room mics, with the proper mic setup, played by a professional drummer who knows how to get the sound that you want with a producer who's going to make sure that those drums sound the way that your song needs them to sound. That's a deal if you ask me. So if you're interested, again, that is rhinestonemusic at gmail.com. That keyword is Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N. And uh, I look forward to hearing from you. Obviously, you, you, you go with Anna to Mercedes and you make a studio out there. And then you made another studio, which is the one that the Strokes found, which was the Transport, Transporteram, if I'm getting that right. Yeah, there's, there's your German, Transporteram. Yes. Yeah, that's yes. right. Uh, which is isn't that a Star yeah. Trek reference? That's a Star Trek reference, isn't it? It actually is. The the producer from Berlin, Moses Schneider, he named his studio Transport Around because he was a Star Trek fan. And then he helped me he also helped me with equipment and moral support building that studio in New York. So I named it in honor of his Transport Around New York City. Yeah. And so how when you got started in New York, was it a quick, like, were you able to trans? Were you when you were there? Was it just? Did you just start going there with the intention of producing, or was it no a? Way. Or no you, way. I know you went there with her, but how did you? How did you get wrapped up in producing with out there? It's a great question, and it's one of the magic mysteries of my life. I didn't want to be a producer for other people. I didn't want to sit and hear other people's songs. I wanted to be a rock star working on my own music day in, day out. And I did that for like two decades, okay? And then suddenly I'm in New York and all my money from being in that famous band, Sky Cries Mary, was like disappearing. And I'm starting, and I'm and the, the lady who runs Bear Creek, Manny, she's going like, Gordon, I'll, I'll show you how to make a resume. You're gonna need a job soon. You know, you're living in New York City. You've got huge rent to pay you got the studio you got a lot of things so let me help you get a job 
And like just when I was about to have to get a job, uh, somebody said, someone from New York said that they heard from a friend of mine that I knew how to record stuff. And would I record their band? And I go, okay. So I recorded a band and then that drummer from that band said, wow, this Gordon guy just got a drum sound in like 20 minutes and it's really cool. Why don't I bring my other band there? And within like three or four months, suddenly I was a producer for other people, which I never intended to do. It wasn't on my game plan. But on the other hand, I'd already been recording for 20 years, like all day, every day, recording my own stuff and experimenting. So when it came time to record other bands, I just remembered all my tricks and how to get good sounds. And I gave them the benefit of my experience. So I'm... I'm going to jump ahead a little bit because one of our audience questions actually kind of refers to this. Um, and the audience question was, um, how did you get your first couple of clients as a producer? And did you have to work for free when you did those, those first couple of clients? I recorded my own music and had my own bands for free for two decades in Seattle. Okay. Really literally yeah. like play shows, didn't get paid would work recording my songs that nobody heard. Like I was working for free. I didn't have a job. I was very penniless uh, in my early days, you know, but I wanted to record and music was my passion. So I did it. I found a way to do it. Mm -hmm. And then when I got to New York, um, one friend of mine told their ex like band leader that I was a great recording guy and she gave me a chance to record her band. And that literally her drummer brought me the next band. And then pretty soon, I'd say within a month and a half from my first job, I had people coming downstairs to my studio, which was called Chateau Relaxo at the time, like day in and day out, like five or six days a week. Somebody would come to record like one part for an hour and then come back the next week. Someone would do two or three songs. Someone would just do an acoustic guitar and a vocal. Someone would ask me to convert something from a cassette onto a CD through my system. Because in those days, in the late 90s, certainly not everybody had CD burners. Yeah. You know, it was like I, I, I actually made money for a while just like converting people's music and burning it onto CD. That was like something I could do. And was it, a, was it the kind of thing where like, did, did you have any resistance to going to, because obviously you came into New York wanting to be the rock star and you, you end up becoming this producer for hire. Was it, was it a, was that an easy transition for you to make? Or was that like, I imagine that you, if you go into there being a rock star and all of a sudden you're like the, the top guy, you're the, you're the fifth Beatle. Was that a hard transition for you? Well, at first I was really recording bands and then I still had lots of time to come early and days off where I was working on my music with Anna Mercedes, Absinthee, and writing my own Gordon Raphael music. So I was still, for the first few years that I was a music producer in New York, I was still very much a creative artist. Like I, I still had the passion. I wasn't a famous producer, I was just a working producer and a working engineer, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, the idea that people were paying me and paying me and paying me like every day, like, oh, wow, I got money to pay my rent. I can go get Thai food. I can take taxis. <laughs> I can go to nightclub. All these things that were like out of my reach were like, I'm in New York City taking a taxi and going to Thai food and then going to go to a bar and see my friend. Like, this was really cool. I liked what producing was doing for my lifestyle. And I found that working with these artists that I was working with, not only was more fun than I imagined, like helping them and being involved in their music and listening to their music as it was being made, but when, th when they showed me how loud they wanted their tambourine or their backing vocal or the acoustic guitar, it was like teaching me stuff. Oh, okay. So some people like to have the, that's, I kind of absorbed a lot of stuff that people want, were requesting into my repertoire of language of recording. You know, I learned a lot in the first few years, especially. I still learn a lot, but in those first few years, you know, turning my homemade art into a service for other people. I really want to please, I want everybody to be so happy that they would tell their friend about me and then I'd get more work. So that was my game plan. Like be really friendly and do a great job for a, a reasonable price and then get more work because of it. Kind of expand my little production empire. And that's what that's what I did. 
Can I ask you this? You know, you don't have to answer this because this can be a little personal. But how were you pricing that stuff back then? Did you have a method for pricing that stuff? Well, I was in a very even though this wasn't one of the studios I built. Chateau Relaxo was something I joined, and it's where I made the transition from being an analog recording guy to a hybrid analog digital guy. I learned how to do digital audio there under the tutelage of the guy who started that studio, Scott Clark. And he still has a brilliant studio called Mercy Sound in New York City right now. But he bought Neves and Avalons and Summits. I had the best equipment. And I never had that before. So for the first time, I had really good gear. Because of the good gear and because I was in New York City, I could charge $25 an hour. And I think my, my rent at the studio was something like I had to pay $700 a month. And the rest of it I could keep from that $25 an hour. Okay. That was kind of like okay. the starting rate. Yeah. I think that's, I think that stuff is so interesting because I think, I think what's really cool is you just kind of fell into it and you just ran with it because it was like, you needed the money and, but it also wasn't like compromising who you are. I, I love that. I think that's really cool. That's kind of how I, uh, I, I've kind of fallen into producing that kind of that same way where it's just, you've, you've, you somebody asks you to do something and then all of a sudden it's like one thing leads to another. And, and obviously I'm not nowhere near as prolific as you. I'm not comparing myself at all to you. You're a, you're a lot younger. So you give yourself some time. I was like, you know, I already had careers and careers in my music before I got like to be a producer for other people or made money at the art. You know, I really had a couple decades of experience before that point. So you might be on course. Well, that's good to hear. That's awesome. You know, I, I've, I'm, I'm in a kind of a similar boat. I've been doing music about two decades now. And, uh, you know, I still always feel like that big breaks right around the corner. You know, my strokes, I feel like they're coming up next, you know? <laughs> right. Well, good. But, so how much time between, or I guess, I guess better question to ask is like, how many records would you say you produced going, starting from when you, you started at Chateau Relaxo until you worked with the strokes? How many albums, songs? Do you have an idea how That's long? Interesting. That's interesting. Um, at Chateau Relaxo, I think I worked on one complete album over a very long period of time, like in sections and lots of individual tracks. Okay. I remember the feeling of recording a few back-to-back -back albums at my next studio, Transporterama, and going like, whoa, this is intense. You just sit there for day in, day out, like you're, and you gotta keep track of all those digital files. You know, you can't lose any solos. You, you gotta be very organized. Not only do you have to be good on your engineering, but at the end of a long day when you're really tired, you gotta be able to back up that shit, collect all the files and make sure that you don't lose anything. It's like right at the end, when you're really tired, you have to do the most important job, you know? So the combination of how many hours I had to sit in the chair to do an album and how much I was responsible for really hit me at Transport Around. And I probably did something like, to be honest, I would say, four or five albums and lots of individual songs, uh, even at Transport Around, lots of individual songs, lots of individual songs at the studio before, but only like four or five albums at Transport Around before the Strokes walked in the door. And even that, at first, that was just an EP, that was just a three song, three day deal. You know, I meet the Strokes and they say, so you record, like, what do you, what's your offer? I say, you come here on a Friday, you leave on a Sunday with three songs. That's the deal. And I do it cheap, you know, and that's what I, that's how it started. And, and how many songs would you say, um, that like you obviously you said a bunch, do you think that would be over a hundred? Do you think that's, you know, 250, how many songs would you okay. say that would be? Let's say that even before I got to New York, I'd already recorded like 600 songs of my own before I even stepped into a, I, and I have them all, you know, I got all my yeah. recordings. Um, I basically learned really quickly that I never wanted to uh, re-record some, I didn't want to make a demo and then do another version. Yeah. I wanted to record the idea as I was writing it and then make that and then move on, okay? So I wound up recording like 600 of my own songs and then I probably did another 20, 30, or 40 with Absinthe, with Anna. 
Mm-hmm. And um, then when I started working for other bands, I imagine I had something like a hundred songs before I met the Strokes. So this is a great, quite a big body of recorded work, not as big of other people's, more of my own. And uh, like, so obviously then it, it wasn't just like you started producing and you met the Strokes. You've put years and years in, of hard work into this before yeah. you got to that point. Yeah. Like two decades before I moved to New York, like literally two decades where I spent recording 600 songs, almost every day writing some songs. If I took a day off or two days off, maybe I'd write three songs in a day. You know, it, was, it balanced out to a lot of music and a lot of time. And in my early days, as I said, because I was penniless and unemployed, I would use my friends' studios in their garages. When they were at work, I'd just go there. When they went to sleep, I'd go there. So for a long time, I was using borrowed recording equipment, but it was fine. You know, it didn't bother me at all. That's awesome. I I, I love hearing that. I think a lot of people underestimate the importance of putting in the work and doing, having, paying the dues. Yeah. Well, the hardest part was right at the beginning because I wanted to record my ideas and yet the wires were so confusing, like input and you know output, and the thing goes in there and then goes to the effect unit, like all that routing, and then using a tape recorder and like erasing parts that I wanted to keep, or um, just over distorting the tape because I didn't keep track of my level. Like the getting started was really hard, and then once I kind of got over the hump, like once I made my first song that sounded cool, then it was like fun from that point on it was like this is fun man i'm gonna go turn this tape recorder and this echo machine on and my synthesizers and who knows with what i'm gonna come up with by the end of the day but i know it's gonna be great in in those days when you're doing this this is the 80s and 90s right if i'm if i'm getting my timeline yeah, right yeah. started started working started learn, trying to record shit in the 70s my first, my first ever completed song was January 1st, 1980. And from there on, I was like in a rocket. I was like recording and recording and recording. So when, how, I've always wondered this because obviously like I'm a lot younger than you. And the mm-hmm. way I learned to record was YouTube, forums, uh, I mean, YouTube University. How did people back then gather the knowledge uh, like how, how where did you go for information where you i mean did you go to your local library i mean i honestly i don't know how did you go back then was was a lot of it just trial and error but even at a certain point there are some basics you need to learn like where did you go to learn that kind of stuff okay so when i was first of all when i was about 17 there was a synthesizer in my high school and i always wanted to play synths because i listened to synthesizer rock and roll that was just a new form coming out i listened to it and i really wanted to get my hands on it but I knew I couldn't operate the tape recorder or the synthesizer. I had ideas and I could play keyboards. So I got a physics student and I said, come here, sit down here, make me a wind. Okay, now make an ocean wave. Now make a melody, thank you. Now record it on that machine and make an echo. And he was doing all that stuff because he could do, he could talk to machines. He was already a smart guy, okay? Mm-hmm. And then, when I was 18, I got in a really famous band in Seattle called Sorcerer's Apprentice. And they got into the biggest studio with 24 track tape and a producer and an engineer and everything. And that was a miserable experience. Like I, I couldn't figure it out and I played wrong. And that was really bad. That was a bad recording experience. Mm-hmm. And the next thing that happened when I was 19 is I got in a band with a cat who taught himself how to play bass to the highest level in a few years. And he borrowed a four track reel to reel tape recorder from his community college, Skagit Valley Community College in Washington state. And he taught himself to basically record symphonies of sound, layers of guitar synthesizer, voices, backwards uh, cups being filled with water, harmonies, drums he he was doing the most incredible things i joined this band with this like genius guy who showed me his songs and i'm going like i want to do that i want to do that so eventually a year later when he wouldn't be around i'd like to put a piece of tape on and try to record i started like just trying to imitate him like put my synthesizer into the mixer play a melody try to record it try to make an overdub like 
I basically did it by imitating his brilliance and it was really a lot of trial and error, a lot of error, a lot of failing, a lot of frustration, a lot of, I'd record something and I'd think it was terrible. So, and I'd lose my hope and I'd come back again and try again. So there were a few years of really trial and error. That's awesome. I, uh, you're just, I think that's so cool. Cause I, you know, I've always wondered how, like I said, like now kids these days, I, I talk to young musicians all the time and they just go look up like, how do I make an uh, NBA young boy type beat on, on YouTube? And it'll show them like, oh, this is the plugin you use. This is the frequencies. This is the EQ spectrum. And, and before you know it, you've made something like that. And so I think when you talk to older cats like yourself who, who've gone through it, I just think it's the coolest thing ever. Like I, I, I'm always fascinated with how they learned the process. And a lot of it is like that. I feel like it's, it's, it's you find someone who has the gear and you borrow it and you figure it out and before you know it you're starting to learn things and then you start going what if i did this and it just starts creating all these crazy soundscapes and i think that's what what makes music so much fun is that you can you can throw all sorts of different things in the way and come up with something totally unique i love it Agreed. it's just such a cool i'm also a huge fan of the university of youtube i mean i've seen like it's so great what's out there and what you can learn and even i have an 8 year old grandson and he, he's like a genius. He knows about every animal and whose enemies are. And he knows every dinosaur. And he knows all kinds of digital video games and characters and all this huge vocabulary that he learned from just watching the computer. I'm yeah. just impressed with what, what it's done for him. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. So how did the Strokes find out about you? They played a show at a small club. And the promoter of that show was somebody that I was interested in for Absinthee. I wanted her to promote shows for Absinthee and book us. Mm -hmm. She said, come see my party. I saw two bands play at the Luna Lounge in the year 2000 in Seattle. I mean, in New York, sorry. Mm -hmm. And um, the first band I really loved, they were called Come On. And when they finished their set, I gave them a transport around business card, a little blue business card. I said, come to my studio. It's right down the street in the East Village, man. I can make great demos cheap. And they never came. And then the second band, I didn't like them as well. I didn't think they were that, they were very stylish and very proud of themselves, but I didn't get the music. But when I saw two of the guitar players get on stage to collect their pedals afterwards, I decided to walk up to them and say, Here's my card. I uh, record bands. I have a studio in the East Village, very close by. Come see me. I can make really good demos cheap. And Albert called me. So that's exactly how it happened. Did they have any buzz at that point? Were they complete unknowns? Like, were, I, I mean, know. obviously, that's so I crazy. Mean, they, they played for 50 people at the Luna Lounge, and they just wanted to make a demo to try to take them to the next level of club. They really were just like... And rock and roll was not popular. Like they, so even if they were great, um, they, that wasn't a respected art form really at that time in New York. It, you know, acid jazz and house music and jungle drum and bass. That's what everybody was talking about. <laughs> Nobody was talking about guitars because the grunge movement had died like four years previously. And so that was the last kind of time that anybody talked about guitars too much. And how, what, so <laughs> you give them the card, what happens, mm -hmm. what happens next? How is it, is it a week before they call you? Is it a month? How soon did they call you? Three days later, Albert calls. The next day I invite him to the studio to look at it. He comes over by himself. He's got a little like brown suit with a tie and little the tennis shoes, you know, like a uh, Converse and everything. Curly hair, super young. And he looks around, he goes, oh, I really like this place. We've recorded in some studios that are like really sterile and corporate, and we just can't even feel comfortable there. This is cool. And he said, play me some stuff you've recorded. I played him a few things. He said, well, that's good. And he, he told me when I was researching my book like three years ago, I actually had a conversation with Albert about this moment. And he told me that he literally ran home after that day. Mm -hmm. uh, they lived about a mile away. Uh, him and Julian lived a mile away from my studio and he ran home to tell Julian that they had to record there 
and then within a few days they had arranged to come for a three day session. And how did that session go? Like obviously obviously we know the final output is is the modern age EP, which is of course legendary, probably one of the greatest EPs of all time, if we're being honest. And and but how how did that recording session go? Well that was a three day, three song deal, and what you hear is the end of a Friday, a Saturday, and a Sunday. And I'll go to the end of the story first, which is when I ran into Albert, who was handing homemade CDs out to record stores on St. Mark's in New York, and he said, hey, Gordon, uh, Rough Trade wants to put this out, you know, on their record label. And I said, well, you better come in and we got to do some mixing on it, don't you think? <laughs> they go, oh, no, they like it just the way it is. I'm like, <laughs> what? You're going to make a demo into a recorded album and that people are going to hear? That's crazy. I, I couldn't even imagine <laughs> it at the time. So literally... The, the, the modern AGP is the result of their first three days meeting me. Came in on a Friday, you know, at 11 in the morning, left at Sunday at about two in the morning, and everything that happened in those three days, you know, you can hear the results. And it was actually very difficult for me to do that with them because they were very young, but very smart and very bright and very particular about every sound and every volume and every tone and every performance. So I wasn't used to working that hard for three days in a row. I've recorded many bands and they're like, hey man, that's close enough for jazz or it's rock and roll, <laughs> it's not rocket science. Like that, yeah. that was a common kind of view, right? But not with the strokes. It's like, nope, we rushed the intro, do it again. Nope, that note on the bass, the G is quieter than the F sharp. Make it just the same volume. You know, like it was really meticulous and detailed work from the very beginning. That's so awesome. So I'm going to I'm going to get right back to that point, but I want to I want to skip ahead obviously. So the Modern Age EP no. comes out. It's a huge sensation in England. It does super well. Um they get signed to Rough Trade. They they go and they decide to make the sec the first album with you is this it obviously a classic, and they one of the things I loved that you talked about in the book is just that is about the details that these guys would go through, and not only on themselves but each other's parts. Like you talk about how um, Nikolai would say things about Fab and Fab would say things about Julian's vocals, and they were so they were so on top of each other about every little detail to make it sound that the way that they wanted it to sound. And so my question is, is did they ever have any creative disagreements in the studio about that kind of stuff? And if so, how did they resolve them? I don't know if they had creative disagreements because in a way, in those early albums that I worked on, Julian wrote them. He was like the mastermind of the parts, mm -hmm. you know? So there wasn't a lot of like, hey, I want to play this on the guitar. No, that's not the part I wrote, you know? It's mm -hmm. like, so, so on a creative level, there wasn't uh, a great deal. Maybe after 10 takes of something on the drums where Fab is pounding it hard and Julian's going like, dude, you're like slowing down and speeding up. Maybe that made him frustrated. Maybe yeah. it made him want to throw the headphones down and like blow off some steam. Mm -hmm. And I saw them get into some little conflicts with each other. But I also saw them instead of like being real childish about it, one guy smashing something, one guy leaving, you know, yelling, what, they would just sit there and work it out. So there were conflicts in the, in the making of the album, not many, but they were very interestingly and powerfully resolved so that things could get going quick. Now, when they would resolve these issues, like was it did they talk it out? Yeah. Were they were they just like, all right, you go to your room for ten minutes and come back, or what? No, how did they? They talk it out. They talk it out. Like I see you're mad. I see you're mad. Look at your face. I can tell by your face you do some. You know, like no, no, really, you did that. Oh, I, I did that. Oh, you know, like they talked it out mm -hmm. uh, right in front of me. Like I would, sometimes I'd see it through the window. I didn't privy every word. But I could see, wow, these guys are like really mature. That's what kind of people even my friends don't do. They all ask like prima donnas and children and, you know, everybody throws a fit or gets drunk or sabotages stuff. But that wasn't happening. It was just pure conflict resolution. <laughs> And so it, was there ever like, did they, was it a very democratic 
creative process with the band or was like Julian or whoever, was they like, no, I, if, I mean, was there ever any issues where like somebody wasn't satisfied or was, did it have to be like all across the board? Everybody's happy. It pretty much had to be everybody was happy, but everybody was working towards a unified front. And of course, since again, like Julian was the leader in a way and he wrote the parts and he had his hearing and his power of musical observation, even on that first album, was like uncanny, like freaky details. You know, his sense of timing and tempo and fluctuation is far beyond what I've ever achieved in my life. You know, like just watching him analyze music and talk about it, it's kind of scary what he can see, right? Mm -hmm. But let's say he would sing a part and maybe Fab would say, hey, Julian, man, I heard you do that at practice a couple times and you did more like this. And like, so they would talk about it and work it out. You know, each person would have opinions about the other person, but it was more in the friendly spirit of cooperation and wasn't didn't interrupt the flow very much at all. It was just all helpful. And even the, 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 the guru, J.P. Bowersock, he was involved in creative discussion. Each guy was there. So it was like five or six people talking all the time. So it seems to me like that that whole situation, there was not a lot of ego in, in any of them. There, it sounds like they couldn't have been if, if that was the, the level at which they were working on it. Was is there a lot of there wasn't any was there any egos in creating that stuff? Well, ego is an interesting topic. We could probably talk for an hour about that, you know, <laughs> like I think that they had enough ego to be very pleased with themselves and powerful and they accomplished a lot in their musicality at a young age, right? But they wanted a chance to have a music career. And to do that, they knew they had to be a team of supporting like brothers. Like they were, they were already so friendly with each other and so happy for this opportunity. So there was a spirit of great cooperation and a spirit of uncanny hard work going on in the band. You know, nothing could, no corner could be cut, no shortcut, no almost, no pretty good. It had to be right, right, right. And they were willing to go as far as they had to, to make sure everything was right. <laughs> so one of the things that's so amazing about the Strokes is the fact that everything fits in, in the Strokes sound. Like the way they, they move, they move as a whole unit, which is what I think is what separates them from a lot of rock bands. Even though there's different parts and stuff, everything overlaps with each other and fits. Was mm -hmm. there anything you did from a studio perspective or any studio tricks to help blend that sound, that famous like blend wall of sounds? Or was that just all of them and their natural sound? I gave them uh, the sounds that they wanted to record, you know, at their interacting with them. Like, here's my mics, here's my preamps, here's a turn your guitar the way you want it. Is that right? No, it should be brighter. Okay, how's that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like I, I interacted with them to get the sound. It wasn't my sound, you know, and they didn't set up the microphones. So it was a communication and an interaction that got the tones. Mm -hmm. The parts themselves were composed by Julian. You know, they were the, the, the thing that's magic about those songs is how they're built. You listen to a bass line that's a melody, two guitars that are basically other melodies and a vocal melody. There's like four melodies and that is not rock and roll. That is Baroque counterpoint harmonic composition, right? And no, most bands, it's like a big rhythm guitar and occasionally in between the singing, there's some decoration from the lead guitar and then maybe a solo space, right? Mm -hmm. But this has nothing to do with that. There's no big chord. There's no decoration. It's all just active melodies supporting each other. And it's in ingenious, you know, and that's what everybody's reacting to is the composition. So the studio trick I would use is when he would say, like, when I play this string on the bass, it's quieter than when I play this string and I've recorded it and fix it. So I had to go to every every time you hit the low G and boost it so it wasn't quieter. You know, I I'd, I'd do that. Yeah. So. I did the techniques and the studio tricks, but they're the ones who said like they wanted it. They're not going to accept a normal bass guitar. They want a bass yeah. guitar where every note is equal sounding, mm -hmm. you know, and they want 
each part that the people played to be heard. So if that meant brightening a few notes on the guitar on this section, or you know, bringing this one a little louder, I, I would do that with them. Now, was it hard? Obviously, if doing any bit of research on you, it's very clear you're a big gear lover. Gear is very important to you. And mm -hmm. the strokes have a very, I would almost say minimalism, like to what they do. And the fact of like, they, there's no, there's no, it's all killer, no filler with the strokes. Like every part right. fits, you know, and I was wondering, was there any, ever any sort of conflict with you as far as like, did you ever try to like push gear on them or push sounds or anything like that? Or was it just all of them? Two stories. The first one is if you look at the recording sessions for, is this it? You will be amazed. It's on Logic Audio, which was a German program at the time, and we were using Pro Tools interfaces and Pro Tools hardware in the computer. But there's literally eight audio tracks of music and one audio track of vocals. Okay. It looks like what most people put that many, most people have that many microphones on their tambourine just for one instrument, right? So it's these ribbons of sound three mics on the drums, a room mic, a bass guitar mic, you know, a guitar mic, a guitar mic, basically something like that. And then Julian singing one track. So when you say all killer, no filler, there's no tambourine, there's no vocal harmony, there's no reverb, there's no echo, there's no phase shifter, there's no effects. Okay. It's just eight channels of sound with a ninth vocal channel making parts all right now one time after we'd been using my 400 dollars audio technica microphone for all his vocals up to a certain point mm -hmm. the guy at the studio across from me had gotten a u87 neumann a 2000 or 2500 dollar microphone which i have right here behind me i have one of my own right so Julian came to a vocal session and I said, Julian, check that out. And he goes, what's that? I said, it's a German microphone called Neumann U87. And he goes, why is it there? I said, oh, try it. You wait till you hear your voice through that thing. And he said, huh? He looked really confused and his feelings were hurt a little bit. Like, where's my microphone? I said, no, no, trust me, just sing into it. So he started doing vocals on one song for, is, for the album, Is This It? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. after a few moments, like maybe after, I don't know, 20 seconds, he said, I hate this microphone. Get it away from me and get my mic back, please. And that was the end. That was the only time. But there is actually one other time. You just reminded me. So was that a funny story? Is that oh, funny? Yeah. That's great. Yeah, it's hilarious. Okay, so you know this story if you've read my book, Room on Fire. We're at a very professional, awesome studio in New York because I was living in London at the time. I didn't have my studio transport around. And all the bands I'd been recording in the year 2002 in England were on tape. Like everybody wanted to use tape, 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 24 track tape. And they had a killer tape recorder, a Studer at the studio TMF where I was recording Room on Fire. So when we got all the sounds perfect for their record, I said, hey, Julian, I want to show you something. He goes, what? I said, I'd like you to try recording on tape. I have a reel of tape here. It's all set up. And he looked at me and he said, I think I've tried tape before and we, I don't think we like it. And I said, no, you've never done tape with me. Like, I know how to get killer sounds on tape. He goes, he looked at me like, he looked with his eyes. He said, he's very psychic. He said with his eyes, he's like, why are you wasting our time? And I'm like, you know, I said, go out there and play the song. So he's sitting in the control room with me and the band is playing the instrumentals and I'm tracking it onto the tape. And I'm listening through the tape recorder and it's sounding damn good. Mm -hmm. So the band comes in, Julian's sitting next to me. The band is all huddled around, ready to hear. Mm -hmm. I press play. The song plays one time through. I stop it and I said, Julian, what do you think? He goes, what do you mean? What do I think? We just spent four hours getting every sound perfect and that fucking machine changed every sound. Get rid of it. That's awesome. Yeah. That's... yeah. So, hey, Gordon, uh, I know we're approaching an hour. Uh, do you need um, to jet out of here in an hour? Is it cool if we go maybe like an extra 15? 
Let's go 15, dude. Awesome. I, but uh, this audience question um, is actually perfect because it fits right into this. How did you get the How did you get the drum sound for Hard to Explain? Uh, it seems to me indie rock for the next 20 years has been trying to copy this drum sound verbatim, and you could even hear it in the latest Harry or the Big Harry Styles single as it was. Everybody's been trying to figure it out how to get this drum sound. How did you do it? Well, as I as you know, I have written a book, and uh, it's detailed note for note how I did it in the book. But basically. Julian came to me when they were about to record that song and he pulled me aside and he said, I've got a problem. I said, what's your problem, Julian? And I hadn't known him very long. We'd only recorded the EP and a few songs for the album. So it's like, I've known the guy for two weeks or something. And he goes, well, I wrote this song on my drum machine. And the problem is I love my drum machine. I think it's perfect, but I don't want Fab to be sitting out on one of the song on his first album he's ever been a part of. Like, I don't want him to feel like he's not on one of the songs. What should I do? And I said, take me to your house. Let's go hear this drum machine. So we went to his house a mile away and he played me this demo. I said, oh yeah, yeah, I got it. And the thing is that all through the 90s, I was really fascinated with industrial music, in particular, a band from Vancouver, Canada called Skinny Puppy. And they were using drum machines and I was recording a lot of drum machines and just manipulating drum machines and understanding drum machines was part of my vocabulary. I really knew drum machines inside out. I know the difference between them, 808s, 909, DMX, Lin drums, you know, Alesis drum machine, all that stuff I've used, I know it real well. And because of my synthesizer ability, I'm very good at making one sound morph into another. So I thought, watch guys, I'm going to make Fab's drum sound like Julian's drum machine. Watch me work. And I thought of a few things like, for example, you can't do a live band take because I don't want any guitars on the drum sound this time. All the other songs were live takes, but this, I want to record the drums first and then record the band separate. So it's really clean, like a drum machine. Okay. Okay, fine. Next thing I did is I know that when I press the snare button on a drum machine, there's no hi-hat trace on it. There's no kick drum. It's just pure snare. So I said, what are you using on this drum beat? Oh, I just got a kick, a snare and a hi-hat. And on one part, I have a ride cymbal. I said, okay, don't play the ride cymbal. Now push your hi-hat as far as you can go where you can still reach it. Now push your kick drum the opposite direction as far as it can go where you can still pedal it. And now your snare drum's in the middle. You're reaching your left hand out really far to hit the hi-hat, but you can still play it perfect. And your foot is a little wider than normal, but there's more distance than any drummer should have between those instruments. For That's what I called separation. And then I just mic'd it up and I used a combination of gates, an EQ with another EQ with another EQ stacked up on top to pinpoint certain frequencies. And that was it. That was the sound. And um, we used a metronome, you know, click track to make it perfect. And we edited the best bits together and then we built the song on top of it. So it's real drums played by Fab, but presented in such a way that it feels and sounds like a drum machine. And so were you were you putting anything in between the like the kick drum and the snare? It was completely open? Yeah, it's completely open, but it was far enough away and the direct mics were close. You know, just some just some cardioid mics, SM57, um, you know, Bayer Dynamic on the Tom or on the something else, you know, it was like it's real individual mics that weren't picking up a lot. Yeah, that's so awesome. I love that. Obviously, Is This It comes out. It's a huge critical and commercial success. I mean, you, you literally produced probably at the coolest band at the peak of their powers for Is This It. And I was wondering, was there any hesitation to to get a different producer for, to, for Room on Fire? Or were you just automatically like you were they, they knew what they did on on uh on is this it and they knew like we're gonna make we're gonna make room on fire with gordon again or did they have any ideas for other producers or were you nervous that they were gonna pick any other producers it's a tender topic 
that pulls upon my heartstrings when I tell you that not only did they start Room on Fire with a different producer, namely Radiohead's producer, but even my coveted and esteemed Is This It, they started with a different producer. Like basically, I didn't have either of those jobs. And boy, was I pissed off the second time. The first time I was pissed off, but the second time when I went into their office and I saw Nigel Godrich's name on a blackboard, my heart just sunk into my stomach. I thought, God damn it, we just had the greatest success with this record. We're such a team. And what are you doing? And he goes, I really like Nigel Godrich's drum sound. I've always wanted to get <laughs> that on our album. You know, and luckily, both times they started it with the other producers, they called me back. Uh, and the third time, they started with me and then fired me and got a different producer. <laughs> so there you go. And you know what's crazy about, because uh, you're talking about Ni Nigel Godrich, right? From That's who you're talking about? You know what's crazy is I think I think the next two Radiohead albums, Hail to the Thief and... Uh, and uh, in Rainbows, I think they steal a lot of the drum sounds from Is This It, especially songs like especially songs like Miro Maxtosis and Nude. I mean, I I, I, I mean, I, what the, the audience question earlier about the hard to explain drums, I think everybody was trying to capture that drum sound. I remember being in indie rock bands in Seattle and like we would talk and we'd always say like, play it like the strokes, play hard to explain, just keep it straight and simple. And I mean, I think, I think it's just so funny that they tried to replace you with him, but I honestly think he's took more from you on those next two Radiohead records, which is well, cool. I hard. think I never heard that before. I never knew that before. And so thanks a lot. <laughs> oh, definitely. So how did Regina Spector enter the picture? Regina Spector entered the picture because there was a fantastic drummer slash producer from New York who I'd, he helped me learn how to do drum editing in Chateau Relaxo, and he's a friend of mine. And he called me up when I was living in London and he said, Hey, Gordon, are you coming to New York anytime soon? And I said, Yeah, I'm coming for Christmas holiday. I'm going to go to parties for like a week straight, and I'm going to be in New York in like three days. Funny you mention it. And he goes, Well, would you like to record someone? And I said, no, actually, I don't want to record anybody because I just spent a whole year recording here in London and I'm tired of recording and I've recorded the greatest people already. And he said, well, I got this 23-year-old Russian girl and she's really good on piano. And I thought, hmm, a Russian girl who plays the piano, that sounds intriguing. And I said, I'll meet her, but I'm not recording anything. I'm just too tired and I just want to party, man. I'm going to New York to party in my old neighborhood. So I met Regina Spector at this studio and she started playing Poor Little Rich Boy from Soviet Kitsch, that song. And she was beating a chair with a drumstick like horses galloping and playing left hand on the piano like Beethoven or something and then singing like the Moldy Peaches meets Joni Mitchell all the time looking at me right in the eyes. And I'm thinking, oh, this is where I got the title for my book. I thought, oh my God, the world is going to love this. I have to record it immediately. And I said, is the studio free right now? And my friend Alan Bozzozzi said, yes. And I said, well, get me 11 microphones. And he goes, what, what do you need 11 microphones with an upright piano and a drumstick? And I said, watch. And I set up 11 microphones, like two on the piano, one on her voice, one on the chair, one in the room. The one in the room was split off to go into a guitar amp down the hall and one on the guitar amp, like something like that. It was like a real interesting little revelation I had because I thought, you got a girl who's so talented on the piano and singing, but girls playing the piano and singing is a, is a kind of a genre. It's, already, it's like there's so many records like that. What can I do to separate this in addition to her ingenuity? And I thought... What if you produce it like a punk rock record with some snap and crackle and a little bit of distortion and like I set the LA 2A and the Neve so that when she sang pretty, it was the most gorgeous warm sound like Ella Fitzgerald, you know, in this big fat U67 microphone right in front of her mouth. But when she started yelling and screaming, well, the needles on the LA 2A were starting to hit really hard and the the Neve was starting to crackle and distort and like, whoa, who heard a girl with a piano like distorting like sometimes when she's yelling? That's cool. Sounded like the equipment was getting mad with her. And so that's how it all started. 
Yeah. How did, or how do you, when you have these enigmatic performers come into the studio, like Regina Spector, how mm -hmm. do you get them to feel relaxed when they are recording? Mm -hmm. Because I've noticed one of the things is a lot of times, a lot of musicians get really tense when they, they, they could be, they could be really, when they perform in live, they could kill it and they could do a great job. But when they get into the studio and they're in front of a microphone and you say, go be great, they tense up and they don't deliver <laughs> that performance. They don't deliver that authenticity. How do you, as a producer, get artists to relax, especially artists like Regina Spector, who are so enigmatic? Well, we touched about this at the beginning of our talk today, which is I'm a musician. I play keyboards, I play guitar, and I sing. And I've done it live on stage since I was 13, and I've been like 25 or 30 bands, okay? Mm -hmm. So when it comes to working with musicians, all I have to do is think, what would I want? What would I want if I was 20 walking into a studio? What would I want now? What you want is you want someone to listen to you and you want to see that they're respecting you and they're not just like ignoring you or in their own fucking world of technical knowledge or expertise. You want them to like look at you like you're a friend, like you're, they're open, they're listening to you. That's the first thing. Oh, that guy's listening to me and they seem to respect me even though they just met me and uh, they're 20 years older than me and they have... 20 years more studio experience. This is cool. They're communicating with me. That's one. Then they need to hear themselves properly. Like if they can't hear a good sound, if that piano sound I gave her in her headphones didn't blow her mind, you know, if it was just a cold, sterile, shitty, average sound, she probably would be nervous and feel like she didn't want to play that well. But if I gave her the most beautiful upright piano sound with these warm mics through a Neve and LA-2A, just being like, wow, it sounds like stereo godhead. It sounds like the record's already been mixed and mastered, and it's just the first track, you know? Then they're going to play like Superman. Like, I can hear myself perfect, and I sound like I'm on the best piano in the world. Yeah. Okay. And then the third thing, just leave them alone. Like, just don't. Just if they want to ask a question or if they need something, give it to them. But just let them play the music and let them do it again when they want. And don't try to talk them into, oh, that was fine. Let's move on. Like, just be cool. All right. So when you say leave them alone, are you like, are like how, how, because obviously you were producing the record. So you have some right. vested interest to make sure it sounds good. Are you, are you like. Do you have, I mean, how, when, when is the point where you're like, all right, like Regina, we need to do this like, one more time, one more time. I mean, are, do... it's like this working with Julian Casablancas and working with Regina Spector, basically everything they're going to do every time they, every time Julian sang a note and every time Regina Spector played a piano note, it's blowing your mind. You're like watching Jimi Hendrix. You're watching Beethoven, you're watching the highest level of musicianship right there demonstrated. So when they tell you that, no, I didn't do a good performance because I made one mistake, you know, they heard that mistake. They know where it was. And I have no job to say, oh, no, it was fine, dude. You know, yeah. th that would be an uncool guy that would make them not like me and not have fun. What they want me to do is they go, I, I, I told Regina time and time again, I said, she'd play a song and I go, oh my God, that new song you just played me for the first time. I am so impressed. You did so great. She said, no, I sang one note wrong and I played one note wrong. Let me do it again. Like it wouldn't do me any good to try to tell her it was good enough or she doesn't need to do that. It just, it doesn't work, you know? Now there's some people where they're singing along and they made a mistake and I might listen to the mistake and I go like, hey, check this out. There's two notes that I want you to sing again. It's incredible. You sang the whole take perfect, man. I love what you've done. Let's go get these two notes. And I do it like just like that, not like, oh, it might be out of your range. Hmm, I could tell you're having trouble. None of that psychological yeah. shit that will make them weak. You know, no yeah. power trip. Just like a lot of compliments for what they did right. And are you ready? Punch. Oh, they get it every time. They get it in one or two tries because there's no attention being drawn to it other than the fact that here's the button push. You know, there's ways of psychologically making people have a great time in the studio. And do you think it's like, 
how much of that do you think is the producer? Like, do you think that is like, obviously we talked about vibe a lot, but I mean, yeah. like I'm a producer, so I'm asking out of curiosity here more so than right. I'm podcasting. But I mean, is that like, obviously how much of that is, is the producer like giving good advice or, or, or like listening right. and paying attention? How much of that is the producer? Do you think? Well, it's like this. You know, certain producers know what the guy at the radio station wants to play. Certain producers know what the guy at the record label wants to sign. I'm the guy who I know what the musician wants to do. I know what they're after because I've talked to them on the phone before we've got to the studio. I've had a week of listening to their demos and chatting about the recording process. I pretty much know what they want to achieve, okay? So when I think of myself as a producer, I don't think I'm the most technical engineer. I don't think of anything, but I think I'm like this guardian angel with a sword, okay? And I'm gonna fucking kill and destroy anything that could possibly get in the way of this artist using that little time we have allotted to achieve their goal, okay? Anything that could make them tense, nervous, hungry, overly drunken, argumentative, frustrated is not going to be part of my session if I can help it with my sword. I'm going to protect them and their right to make great music. And that's what my job is, I feel. like that's, It's a weird abstraction that I'm like, I'm guarding their ability to make the sound that's in their mind. And that's all. That's all I care about. I love it, man. I, I That's so awesome. Yeah, that You're Thanks. inspiring me so much. All Thank right, you. so... I've got a couple rapid fire questions for you and we'll wrap this interview up. Sound good? Great. Awesome. So what was the last album that blew your mind that you listened to? Last, last album? I mean, I listen to old music all the time, you know? So the last album I listened to about 10 minutes ago, uh, before I started this interview was extrapolation by John McLaughlin. That album blows my mind Ooh. every, I listen to it every day. I listen to that album every day. I listen to two songs of that album before I go to sleep at night. It's one of my favorites. Is that, is that more of his fusion era? Like, is that, that's post that Mahav like, Mahavish? No, it's before Mahavishnu. It's like he just got oh, out of really? Miles Davis. Hi, wow. I just played electric guitar with Miles Davis. Nobody's ever done that before. And now I got my little group together. I'm gonna play the most outrageous music and push every boundary on the guitar and jazz and music and rock in one record you know oh man i had no idea you were a jazz head man i would have i would have structured this pod you're not I'm no not but john mclaughlin <laughs> and some miles davis and some thelonious monk and some bill evans yeah for sure <laughs> wow that's so crazy i had no idea okay uh okay okay yeah, we'll have to have another podcast and just talk about those records another time. Please, please. Uh, and up and up, who's an up and coming artist that we should all know about? Cab Ellis in New York City, C A B E L L I S. I recorded an album with them at Bear Creek Studio two summers ago, and just now they're starting to get some insane buzz in New York City. Love that band. So it's it's a it's a band. It's a band. It's a band. It's like a I don't know, hip hop and funk with horns and Iggy pop uh, all rolled into one. Really killer. I'm in, that sounds awesome. Look it up, the album's, called, the album's called The East Coast Hold On and it's on Spotify and it's unbelievably good. And you produced this record. I did. That's awesome, that's so cool. Thanks. All right, this one's a little more abstract but I'm, I'm excited to get your take on this. If you lost all your gear and had to start over with one thousand dollars, what are you getting? Oh, definitely no problem, no question. My ARP Odyssey synthesizer, um, even if it's a Korg reissue for four or five hundred dollars, I'll get that first. And uh, with the uh, with the remaining uh, money, uh, geez, um, some kind of uh, Audio Technica cheap condenser mic, and that's where I'd start with. Awesome. And then uh, who is a producer you look up to? Um, let's see. What's his? Uh, uh, gosh. Uh, uh, Jimmy Page. What about yeah. Jimmy Page appeals to you as a producer? 
uh, the Led Zeppelin album, the Led, the Led Zeppelin albums he produced are mm -hmm. like unbelievable. Like, he, you know, he wrote the book, you know, uh, I like mm, Ken Scott with David Bowie, uh, of course, George Martin and um, the Rolling Stones producers, Glenn Johns or whoever produced the help produce. They might be engineers too. Eddie Kramer, mm -hmm. he engineered Hendrix and Led Zeppelin. So, but I like his, I respect his work. Um, yeah. And then what do people get wrong about being a music producer? Uh, let's see. What do they get wrong about being a music producer? Jeez, I don't know. Um, people get wrong that the, just because they have the, you know, the title of music producer and that job and the income or the status or the experience that uh, young musicians are very intelligent and they don't need you to boss them around or think you know better than them. You know, music producers, by and large, get a real superiority complex and they don't listen anymore to new ideas. And all the musicians I work with are young and new and they got millions of ideas that are worth listening to. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Gordon, Thanks. this has been such an amazing interview. I have learned so much. I've got so many. I got about five pages of notes here. Um, okay. I have had such a good time. Where can people find you? And is there anything you'd like to plug in this last little bit? Um, well, I have Gordon Raphael Instagram and Gordon Raphael TikTok. I like those. I have a website called Gordotronic. And um, you can buy my book and talk to me personally about getting my new poetry books Ooh. Ooh, awesome that's really cool thanks i'll have to pick up a copy for sure um okay. yeah i was gonna tell you gordon i think the 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 mark of a great like band music history book which i kind of put this in it, it's much more than that but I, I that's the section i'd put it in at barnes and noble right if i was barnes and noble i think is cool. would i care about this story if i didn't care about the artists that you're working with and even if I wasn't a fan of the Strokes or the Libertines or Regina Spector, I think your story is so fascinating and so inspiring and so exciting. It has sex, drugs, rock and roll. It honestly, I, I had no idea what to expect going into this. And I think it's honestly one of the best rock and roll memoirs I've ever read. And I've read a bunch of them. I honestly, I would Thank put you. this in my top 10. No, no joking. Yeah, guys, everyone, the world is going to love this. Up from the basement of the Strokes, Gordon Raphael. It is from Wordville Publishing. You can get this on Amazon, right? I believe that's where I picked this up. You can get it, you can get it from my publisher and I'll sign it, or you can get it on Amazon cheap and cheerful. Awesome. Well, Gordon, thank you so much. I appreciate your time, and thank you so much for coming on the Rhinestone Podcast. Thanks for having me. Really appreciated it. Let's be honest, the music industry is a treacherous place. One bad step and you can absolutely ruin not only your musical career, but your financial life. And believe me, it happens so often, you'd be shocked. I have personally met artists who've ruined their musical careers because they signed one bad contract. I've even been offered some of these bad contracts. People wanting you to pay to fly to Germany so that you can sell some t-shirts, crazy stuff. I'll get into that in another episode someday. But truth be told, there is a lot of gatekeepers out there in the music industry that hide stuff from artists, that don't tell them what to do. Because if they can keep that information from you, they'll always have power over you. Now, I've been very lucky. I've been making music almost 20 years. I've been involved in so many different sides of the music industry, not only creatively, but I've also been on the business side of things. I have worked for a major label. I've been on creative teams for major label artists. I have booked festivals. I've managed bands. I've won Battle of the Bands competitions. I have worked with songwriters and publishing deals and things like that. And I've learned a lot in my time. And I've made so many mistakes, it's not even funny. And one thing is now that I'm getting older and I'm kind of realizing like, I'm not gonna be a pop star. I'm not gonna be on the cover of Rolling Stone anytime soon. What I want to do is I want to give that information to artists and I want to help them and I want to make sure that they set themselves up for success so that other people don't go and take advantage of them. Now I'm not saying I know everything, but I am saying that I know quite a bit that can 
help artists get in front of the right people and help them get to the goals that they want to have. So at Rhinestone, we have a consulting service, and this consulting service has been working so well for so many artists that we've reached out to. The way that we do this is that we work in a reverse engineer system, which is we figure out where you want to go in the next six to 12 months, and we give you three to five actionable steps that you can take immediately to put you in the place for success. And the results have been phenomenal. We've helped artists with songwriting. We've helped artists help get them get tours going. We've helped artists figure out ways to boost their Spotify streams. We've figured out ways for artists to help get their merch game going. And with just a few very simple tweaks and a few key things to help you position yourself better, you can just take yourself to the next level. Now, while I often believe that we've given a lot of help out through our social media and through our podcasts. There's a lot of things that are more personal and more technical that you really need someone to hear your side of the story in order to give yourself a fair shake on what you need because so much of this advice is situational. So at Rhinestone, with our consulting service, we hear you out, we figure out where you want to go. Again, like I said, we reverse engineer the steps. And then we give you actionable steps that can help take you to the next level. And our services, I think, are incredible. I have been so lucky to talk to so many artists. Now, our consulting services normally run $50 an hour. But if you go to the Rhinestone email address, which is rhinestonemusic at gmail.com, and you give us the keyword strokes in the title of the email, you will get your first hour of consulting for absolute free. So again, that's rhinestonemusic at gmail.com, rhinestone, R-H-Y-N-E-S-T-O-N-E, music at gmail.com. And you give us the keyword strokes, S-T-R-O-K-E-S, in the title. Uh, you will get your first hour of consulting absolutely free. No questions asked. We will help you develop a plan. And if nothing else, I hope you guys can get interested in our consulting services. And I look forward to helping some new artists out here. Hey everybody, that is our episode. That is episode three of the Rhinestone Podcast. I want to thank Gordon Raphael for taking his time and spending it with us and giving us so much information, so much game. Um, if you guys want to check out Gordon, please go check out his Instagram and his TikTok. Both are Gordon Raphael. Gordon's book, The World is Going to Love This, Up from the Basement with the Strokes, is out everywhere now. Uh, read it. It is a phenomenal read. I absolutely loved this book. So many great stories about so many great bands, so many insider stories about the Strokes, the Libertines, Regina Spector, all sorts of great stuff. Um, I cannot recommend this book enough. I had so much fun reading it. Our intro and outro music is Target Rockstar by Maddie Music Madness. Our ad music is Half a Heart with Chris Ray King. Uh, we also included in our intro uh, Savage, U District Version by Gordon Raphael. And my name is Banner Driscoll. You can find me at Banner Driscoll Media, uh, wherever you do social media. And uh, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, uh, you want to tell me about how red this shirt is, I don't care. Uh, I would love to hear from you. That is, and please, the best way to get a hold of us is the Rhinestone email, which is rhinestonemusic at gmail.com. That is rhinestone, R H Y N E S T O N E, music at gmail.com. And uh, Till next time, guys, thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing you. Happy music making.